Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Talking Sense I'm right here on Yachting International Radio. And of course, my co-host, Alistair Milroy from Breaking the Mold Accounting. How are you, Alistair? I'm great, Ria. I've um, just had a... I've been going to the gym for the last five months. And um, when I first started, um, I was just squatting 50 kilos, which isn't very much. It's pretty poor back in December. Uh, and today I managed to do three sets, or so three times three of 100 kilos. So, wow. um, yeah, feeling good. But... I'll probably need to sleep after the show. So you you actually go to the gym every day? No, a couple of times a week, and then try to do some cycling and walking as well. Why? But helps me. <laughs> Everybody out there that knows me knows that you know. Yeah, me and exercise. I'll walk for sure. I'll go for a walk, but you know, over and above that. Not really my thing. I, I think I'm allergic because I get a bit sweaty um, and I start breathing hard and, it, you know, it, it's just not good. It definitely helps me with um, yeah, keeping mentally feeling good and, um, yeah, just looking after myself. So I think that's probably a normal response and I'm not. So <laughs> each their own. So, yeah, exactly no, exactly it's amazing though you just do these little things it was only my the guy i trained with today he said do you remember back five months ago you were doing 50 and now you're lifting up and i was like oh, yeah. you sort of forget these things unless someone reminds you of that power well, i guess it makes you feel thing. like you've accomplished something then that's yeah. that's nice you know to sort of look back and go wow yeah you know it's been worth it then exactly no it's great so i'm feeling good but Good for you. Well, I can tell you that you're definitely slimming out in the face. We're going to need a new profile picture for you soon. I know. I'm going to need to organize those, aren't I? It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> definitely slimmed down a little bit. I need to, need to slim down more, but um, yeah, looking a lot better than I was when I got those photos done. Well, you are looking phenomenal. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Let's talk about... Our topic today, we are talking about ownership structures. And ironically enough, um, I was just looking into that myself the last couple of days because um, I'm looking at sort of incorporating my business um, in Canada up to a certain amount. Um, we can do it as an individual. Um, but then once you, you know, reach a certain level of income, you've got to switch over and you've got to be registered as a company or a sole, you know, one of these different ownership structures, as it were. Um, so there are actually five different types of ownership, ownership structures, aren't there? Five. Wow. Well, I mean, that's if you put in the nonprofit entities as well. Yeah. Yeah. Could be at least five. I mean, they're all... Nonprofits are generally types of companies. They're just registered under different acts than the Company Act. Well, let's just start off with the first one. It's probably the first one that most people go into when they are just starting out on their own. Um, the sole proprietorship. What is that? Um, well, a sole proprietorship, or, or if you like, a sole trader, is when you're trading and running businesses yourself. Um, so there's no separate legal entity. You are... The business, I think in Spain, and it's often called autonomo um, status. Uh, yeah, but you're effectively running your business as an individual and you are the legal, you know, you sign the agreements yourself and obviously any liabilities from that business will be directly back to you as well. Um, so that is, I mean, there, there is less cost in a sole proprietorship and setting that up, but at the end of the day, essentially you are legally responsible. So you know, if somebody decides to sue you, you yourself for the rest of your life are responsible for whatever that is. And of course, any other assets you have are also, you know, could be taken into account in settling any liabilities. So if you've got a house or property or et cetera, that there's no protection for, for that property if you're, if you're trading as yourself. Um, but as you say, it's very simple. Um, you pay tax, you know, you have your own set of accounts, you pay taxes, on your business as yourself, you don't have to worry about, you know, preparing sets of accounts and having registered offices and doing annual returns. So it's a bit more administratively simple as well. You don't have company tax accounts and that sort of thing. So this is probably the only ownership structure that allows you to only have to make one tax declaration per year, as opposed to 
doing an yeah. individual tax and then a business tax. Yeah, exactly. Your your individual tax return will, will include your your business in, in that along with any other income you have. Um, and often people, you know, when they're starting out, will just or have, if you've got a business where perhaps it's an evening business or, or part-time, then you know, a lot of people will do that without incorporating. And I guess the next one is a general partnership. Yeah, so partnerships are, again, partnerships, and there's two different types of partnerships. So a general partnership is, is, isn't really, again, a legal entity. It's, a, it's an agreement between two, two or more people who are partners. Um, but it, there's no, again, there's this transparent from a tax and legal point of view. So each partner is involved in that business and the profits are shared in that partnership. Um, and again, you pay tax generally in the individual partner's name. So they any profits will come to the individual partners and they'll put that on their tax returns. And likewise, the drawings, what money they take from the business can also be shown on, on their tax return. So the one, well, the, the one big thing about both of these forms, they, they generally operate the same, you know, depending on whether it's, it's individually owned or through a group of partners. Um, there's not so much legal structure surrounding those types of businesses though is there like there's not no, no it's not a separate legal entity yeah uh, that's a, it doesn't have any legal personality so if you have a partnership and it signs a contract the individual partners are, again are, are signing that contract and for a general partnership they're equally liable for any right. contract that they sign or any debts that they have as a partnership so um, you you will have a partnership agreement and because there's more than one person you, you you do a set of partners accounts because you need to look at the business and you know with different partners want to see what's going on so you have a set of accounts but physically there is no um yeah no distinction between the partners and that partnership uh, so. but governmental wise as well there's not as many restrictions placed on these types of businesses as when you start getting up into you know corporate entities and that sort of thing no no, it's much more, you know, uh, in the past, it's, it's changing now, but in the past, a lot of uh, legal and professional practices would be general partners, partnerships. Um, you see them less now again, because the, the big, like, the biggest risk, I guess, to them is because it's not a separate legal entity. Again, you have the unlimited liability for any debts or legal costs that come you know, if someone sues you your partners are liable themselves and all their assets are unprotected from that partnership. Um, so we're seeing more and more professional firms move towards what are called limited liability partnerships, which are a bit more corporate in structure and have a separate identity. And the next one is a limited liability. Which is what I touched on. So a limited liability partnership, um, Again, can be more than one partner, but you, it it has a corporate structure, and there is a limited liability act, if you like, that of regulations that so they're registered with normally with the company registry in whichever jurisdiction you're in, um, and you have two types of partners: you have a limited partner and a general partner, and there will be a formal partnership agreement saying what the roles of each are. Um, but in really, really simple terms, the general partner tends to have a very small share of the profits, but takes care of all the administration um, and, and normally has an unlimited liability as that of that partnership. Um, but general partners are often companies, so that the corporate structure gives it a limited liability in itself. And they will do everything from the accounting, the administration, running the partnership. And then the, uh, the limited partners have a limited liability, which is an amount that will be shown in the partnership in the limited partnership agreement, um, but will have a much larger share of the profit. So often it will be 90, 99% of the profit will go to the limited partners. Again, the limited partner, it's transparent for tax. Um, so the profits are shown in your personal tax return for the limited partners and, and the general partners. Um, but it has limited liability. So 
you're protecting the the partners from um, yeah potential legal claims against the partnership. But this also uh, comes with greater popular, regulation, doesn't it? Yeah, there, well, there's a there's a limited in most com- countries. There's a limited liability act, so there's more re- there's more rules to to yeah. you normally have to um, submit accounts each year. Um, you have to prepare a tax return. In fact, in some countries, like like um, in Malta, you actually when you set up a partnership, what's called a partnership and common deed in Malta, uh, you have to elect whether you want to have that treated as a company. And if you do, then it will pay corporate tax in the same way as a company and it will register and have a tax return as a company. Or if you don't elect that, it it, it stays and pays tax much more like a, a general partnership would. Um, but interestingly, in yachting, part, limited partnerships are used um, often for yacht ownership uh, for various... There are some countries that... Um, impose wealth taxes on luxury assets and yachts generally fall into that. So I know some of the Scandinavian um, countries have very punitive taxes on holding um, luxury assets in a company. Um, so holding a partnership gives you that um, structure in which to own the yacht, but it's still transparent for the limited partners from a tax perspective. Um, and equally in in some countries where you have uh, fringe benefits tax or benefit in kinds tax, um, uh, some advisors will will, uh, recommend using a limited partnership because 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 you're owning it and it's transparent, you're not subject to the risk of your use of the yacht being a benefit. Whereas if you hold it in a company, there's there's a risk that the tax authorities look at your use of the yacht, even if it's a pleasure yacht, and say, well, you're, you're effectively running this yacht as a company, but you're getting the use of it. Um, we're going to tax you on that use. Um, so often, yeah, you'll often find uh, in countries like the UK and, as I said, Scandinavia, limited partnerships will be used to, to own yachts. So what is the difference then? Because the next step up is corporation. What really is truly the difference then between a limited liability company and a corporation? Um, a limited liability partnership or a com- limited liability company, I guess. Um, well, a company, uh, yeah, I guess there's different types of companies, but most companies will be limited. Um, and normally that's limited by the shares that you put in. Um, in different countries that you'll have proprietary limited companies in Australia, for instance, which are still smaller limited companies, then you have your stock exchange listed companies, which are what normally are referred to as public companies, um, where there's lots of shareholders, they're traded on, uh, on an exchange. Um, and because they're listed, they have a lot greater regulation around the type of information they give to investors, how often they publish their results, you know, how they publish them. Um, they've got to communicate with the, with the stock exchange a lot more in terms of when they're issuing dividends and things. For most of us running small businesses, um, limited companies probably the most common structure and, and likewise in, in yacht ownership. Um, the key benefit obviously of a limited company is you're limiting the liability. Yeah. Um, and you're limiting it to the share, the amount of share capital that you put in. So you'll often you'll often see with a, with a yacht owning company, for instance, that the share capital is quite a small amount um, and then the contributions for the operating expenses by the shareholders will be treated as a loan or a contribution. You know, it's, it's really interesting because it's, it's almost like a step-by-step, you know, you're sort of climbing the stairs, right? And, and you start off at sole proprietorship and then, you know, you take the next step and the next step and the next step. Um, I, I'm really interested in finding out at some stage about shell corporations, because of course, with all that is going on in yachting right now and with the Russian and Ukraine conflict, um, you know, these, it, it's taking months upon months for governments to figure out who owns these yachts because there's so much structure going around hiding them. Um, and it's one company upon another upon another. It's almost like leapfrogging. Um, and, and perhaps we can get into that again um, at some later date. Yeah, definitely. I mean, certainly in yachting, there's um, and 
it, it clearly it depends where you where you set up your company. In most jurisdictions, there's been a lot of international pressure on jurisdictions to make sure you know who owns the companies that are being set up. And actually, some of the some of the uh, laxes to uh, some of the countries like America, where you have states like Delaware and, yeah. and Nevada, etc., where you can actually set up a company without providing any due diligence at all. I think we'll see some of that change. Um, I actually most- saw there's a movie on Netflix, actually, that is literally all about Delaware um, and how many yeah. com- companies or corporations and companies are actually registered in Delaware. And I find it really interesting because I think for many years, we have always thought that there were these islands tucked away that were actually where people were hiding their assets. And then it's not actually until, you know, some of the movies like this come out and mainstream people start watching this and going, actually, the U.S. has quite a few people that are places that you can hide your. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, and we've seen quite a lot of reference to to London. And and obviously now there's a a move towards seeing more transparency around property registries of who owns property in the UK, et cetera, which I think we'll we'll, we'll continue to see. Um, in most, in, you know, in, in what I'd call reputable jurisdictions, there is, you know, when you set up a company, you have to show who the owner is, you have to prove your source of wealth, you know, and that, that's more, much more than just saying family inheritance. You have to give a detailed story around how you built up the wealth that is going to be, you know, that's allowed you to, to purchase the asset or have the structure and provide some evidence of that. Um, and I know certainly in, I use Guernsey because I've worked there for 16 years, but um, and Malta now as, as well, you have to have that beneficial ownership um, register in place in Guernsey. Every company that's set up as an agent and that agent must hold full AML on. So it's not, a, it's not available publicly. If you look at the registry, you might not be able to see who the owner is, but if any law enforcement agencies want to see that information, it is all fully verified. Um, you know, down to having proof of address and your passport and your detailed source of wealth and having a, you know, the, the corporate service provider will actually have to risk rate. So they'll have to look at the risks involved with that, you know, where it's trading, where the, yacht, where the ownership is, um, where the money's being made, what industries are involved. Um, and see some industries, you know, extractive industries like mining, some countries, clearly Russia is, is one at the moment and, and places in Africa tend to be considered more high risk. So you look at all these factors and coming up with a, a risk and then depending on that risk, you're looking at how often you monitor that. Um, but it, as you say, it's taking with, with you know, not all jurisdictions have that level of, of regulation and it, it's taking investigators some time to try to work out who owns these assets and who is the you know see i was never good at numbers and i couldn't i couldn't imagine mind you i guess it's a bit of investigation but um and and i do like the research aspect of things but it is very complicated it's extremely complicated alistair i want to say thank you very much um and yeah it's if anybody is looking to set up a company or is looking to take the next step um in their ownership structure can they get a hold of you and, and can you advise them? Yeah, sure, I can. I'm uh, In terms of yacht ownership structures, a corporate I work with some corporate service providers, so it's a very specialist area. So I have some partners that I can work with in, in jurisdictions, but yeah, definitely can, can help and set out the steps. I think a lot of people, when buying yachts particularly, leave it quite late in the buying process to, to think about the ownership and... and that can often um, be well, be to the detriment of the the enjoyment that you get from the yacht when you're first setting it up. So I would definitely encourage people to think about that ownership structure early and and also getting that structure in place to give them the time to to make sure it's administered properly. Nice. Well, we'll make sure to, as always, provide all of your information below this interview when it airs. Um, I want to say thank you so much for, you know, every single week coming here and, and educating us. No, thank you. No, I enjoy it. It's 
part of it's what I like doing is, is actually providing the education and hopefully giving people a better experience in business and ownership of their yachts. Great. You've been watching another episode of Talking Sense with Alistair Milroy of Breaking the Mold Accounting. My name is Rhea. I've been your host. We'll see you again next week.